Hello, fellow risk takers, and welcome to my worst investment ever. Stories of loss to keep you winning. In our community, we know that to win in investing, you must take risk. But to win big, you've got to reduce it. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm on a mission to help one million people reduce risk in their lives. To reduce risk in your life, go to myworstinvestmentever.com today and take the risk reduction assessment I created from the lessons I've learned from more than 500 guests. Fellow risk takers, this is your worst podcast host, Andrew Stotts from A. Stotts Academy, and I'm here with featured guest, Richard Moran. Richard, are you ready to join the mission? I'm ready, Andrew. <laughs> and I, I, how did I do with my radio voice there? You, you sounded like uh, an FM radio voice that is on at 2 o'clock in the morning and hope that somebody out there is listening. <laughs> and that's, that's the story of my life. I actually, in uh, Cleveland, Ohio, where I grew up, we had a channel called WMMS. And the guy that came on at about midnight is the BLF Bash. That yeah. was his name. And just just like, just like went crazy when that yeah. guy came on. Yeah. <laughs> the, the secret to an FM voice is you don't yell at people. You don't make people feel guilty. You just bring them in and welcome. And, and the audience is going to understand why I'm asking you that question when I introduce you to the audience. Richard Moran is a Silicon Valley veteran in both investing and operations. He is general partner at Tonic Bio Ventures, an early stage life sciences venture firm. Previously, he was the president of Menlo College. His background includes serving as a partner at Venrock, CEO at Accretive Solutions, Chairman of Portal Software, and a Managing Partner at Accenture. His track record includes successful exits in software, gaming, food, and life sciences. He is a best-selling author with 10 books to his credit. His latest book is Never Say Whatever, to be published by McGraw-Hill. He has a syndicated show in the workplace on CBS radio and is an influencer on LinkedIn where he is a regular contributor but never reads the comments. <laughs> Richard, take a moment and tell us about the unique value that you bring to this wonderful world. Well, thanks, Andrew. Um, I, my value is uh, I tell the truth and I tell it in sort of a funny way. And I talk about things that other people are not talking about. So we, you mentioned that I have a radio show on uh, CBS that runs on weekends. And the, I'd like to say that I'm, my content is so spectacular that, uh, that there's a clamor for it. But the truth is the stock market is closed on the weekends. So radio stations need to fill their business section with content. So that's me. So on, uh, in my radio show, I don't talk about strategic planning. I don't talk about spreadsheets and pivot tables. I talk about things like, should you take your dog to work? Or what do you, how do you deal with the guy who, who sits next to you who reheats his fish burrito every day in the microwave and stinks up the office. So it, the, it's sort of like Seinfeld. You know, it's a show about nothing, but it's really important because I'm talking about things that other people are not talking about. And it, and it resonates because it's, 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 it's what's on people's minds. So my, my contribution to the world is telling the truth and giving people an exit uh, so that they can deal with all the vagaries of the workplace and not making it complicated. It's interesting because you said, when I asked you, you know, like, what's your unique value? You said, I tell the truth. Well, doesn't everybody tell the truth? Like, you know, that was my first reaction. What, what is it that, that's going on in this world, you know, where somebody really can be unique by just telling the truth? What is that? What do you mean by that? Yeah, well, it's... Um, it, uh, I, I talk about it a lot in my latest book, Never Say Whatever, which you mentioned, because lots of times, uh, instead of telling the truth, we say whatever and move on. And that's, that's not, you know, somebody brings a dog to work and you're allergic to dogs. 
You say, whatever, I'm going to have to have to deal with it. No, you should tell the guy not to bring his dog because it's a, it's a problem. So telling the truth, I'm not talking about great truths in the, in the universe. I'm talking about if the product doesn't work, somebody needs to raise their hand and say, you know, we're not ready. If, you're, if we're cutting costs in the wrong places, somebody needs to talk about that. So it's about, it's about just double clicking on, on the truth and getting to, to uh, a spot where people can make the right decision, I guess. And truth is, a, is not a long commodity. I know you're a global show uh, in, in the US right now, Truth is not necessarily the a commodity that we have too much of. Yeah, and it's it's interesting because I'm thinking about you know okay, if if um, if someone is if my mother was to say to me when I was young, tell the truth, she's telling me don't lie. But when yeah. you're talking about the truth, what you're talking about is to speak honestly and kind of directly confront something rather than just pass it off and. Yeah. I'm curious if, if you had, I, mean, I know one of the words that I've you know, heard before and seen before in behavior is like passive aggressive or people that just don't want to deal with things. Have you ever had that experience like when you were young or something that, you know, there was people that just didn't deal with things and, and, and it, it left you in an insecure situation that you just really didn't know how to handle it? Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll tell you a story that was an epiphany for me. Um, I don't talk about it often because a lot of people don't, haven't even heard of the company, but I started my career uh, after graduate school at Atari, the video game company, Atari. I'm sure a lot of your listeners and viewers remember Atari. I do. And we were having, we were, a, it was a juggernaut. Uh, we, were, we were having $100 million weeks of revenue. I mean, it, you could not get your Pac-Man fast enough. We were sold out. But I remember sitting in a strategy session when a facilitator said, you know, are we sure our strategy is on track? And everybody said, you know, there's an infinite demand for Donkey Kong and Ms. Pac-Man is going to, I mean, it's, uh, we just went on and on about how this company is going to grow forever. But in my heart of hearts that day, I knew we wouldn't. I knew that costs were out of control, that it, it was, you know, it was just not a, the, the right thing, but I didn't say anything. And I come to find out later that everyone in the room knew the same thing. No one said it. We didn't tell the truth. And, uh, and you know, two years later, Atari went down the toilet and disappeared. Mm. And I think that was an epiphany for me about just being, being honest, I guess, and at a different level, not just don't lie, but about in your heart of hearts, are we really getting to the to the bottom of what we're trying to talk about. It made me think of a story that I've, I've never told before about my own business, which we now have started, you know, about, let's say, nine years ago with my, one of my best friends, a Thai man here. And he and I started this business, and we had great dreams. And I, it didn't, it didn't work the way we planned. And what I did is I didn't look at the financials. And here I am, a financial guy, and yeah. I just didn't want to look at it. It was just scary that I, it, was, it was evidence that what I was doing wasn't working. And he was patient with me for a while, and, you know, we were able to fund it. It's not like we had a huge, you know, capital needs for the company. But there came a time where he just said, this isn't going to work. And he's a very direct guy, which is not very common for Thai people because Thai people tend to not want to have a confrontation. Yeah. But he basically laid it on me very hard. And he said, I, I'm, I have a wife and a kid, and I have to you know, take care of my family, and this has to work, or else we gotta, we got to end this. Mm -hmm. And man, was it a wake-up call. And it made me realize my obligations are more than just to me, but to him and the other employees in the company. And it took a while from that kind of smack in the face to then wake up and, and start iterating through our different products to make sure that we eventually got it and we got it and now every single month we get our monthly financial statement we close our books every month and i tell every small business out there you know the number one thing that i recommend you do is get your monthly financial numbers 
close, accurate, and on time, and review them just for an hour. And if you do that, it's going to be, as I say, finance is like a mirror, and it just, it's just a relentless mirror. So it made yeah. me think of that story. And it's not only the numbers, it's, it's behaviors. I mean, how many times have we seen a, a leader or a CEO who tolerates poor behavior from their assistant? So, you know, I, I've seen CEOs who have no trouble firing 3,000 anonymous people in a different country, but they can't, they don't tell the truth about their own executive assistant who's a poor performer and will never fire him or her. It's, Boy, uh, you, you're bringing up a lot of things in my head because I, you know, recently have had a, an assistant that's been with me for a long time, and there was a point where I saw her communication with one of the employees was not anywhere aligned with how I would speak to an employee, and it was kind of exercising her power. And I sat down and talked with her, and and then eventually she quit, and it was kind of sad because we had worked together for a while. But I was like, you cannot speak to people that way. It's just not acceptable. Yeah. So that's interesting. And, and that's a great lesson for the people listening and viewing because watch the people around you. You know, it's important. They're communicating a message of who you are and they're doing it through their actions. So that's, but that's also a good, Andrew, that's a good lesson out of my new book. Because you could have said for, with your assistant, you could have said, whatever, you know, she's been with me for a long time. Maybe she doesn't do that all the time, but you did it. You made a decision. And that's why I tell people never say whatever in work. So um, before we get into the big question, um, I have one other story that you raise in my mind. You know, for the listeners, most people know a little bit about my story, which is that I had a drug addiction problem when I was young. And I ended up in different rehabs. And the first first one didn't really work. And the next one got a little bit better. And the third one was a seven month long-term treatment center where it took some, took some work to remold my brain and my emotions and, and become aware uh, and you know, learn how to implement 12 steps and things like that. But the thing that really turned my life around was that the counselors and the 12 step program that I was going through forced me to unearth everything that I had done in the past. I wrote it out, I took a personal inventory, and it took a long time, and, and things just started spilling out as I started going back in my past of all the things that I had done. And then they basically, uh, you know, had me sit down with someone that I trusted and share everything. And then after I shared all of that, I burnt that document, and I had let go of all these things, but then I had to make amends to people you know, that I had hurt, and I had to deal directly with particularly my mom and dad, and that was really challenging, and it was really painful, but what I learned from that was that um, you said, tell the truth, well, the truth shall, shet, shall, shall set you free. From that moment when I was 17 until today, I can say that I let go of all that baggage because I dealt with it directly. And I didn't deal with it directly by choice. I did, dealt with it directly because I had my back to the wall. And I ended up trusting the people that told me. So when you talk about telling the truth, it's also, you know, when I think about it, I just think that, you know, the, the way through most problems is through most problems. <laughs> yeah. There's not a shortcut. There's not a workaround. There are consequences to shortcuts and workarounds that can damage you for life. So I challenge everybody to, you know, follow what Rich is talking about, which is tell the truth and be direct and, and deal with it. For and, and just so your listeners and viewers know, I'm, I'm uh, my specific areas where I, where I encourage people is to be you don't have to give a speech about the truth. I mean, it's sometimes it's just internal. You know, things like, and this is where, you know, I don't write great literature. I pose the question, like, should you take the newspaper to the bathroom with you? No, you shouldn't. <laughs> and you know that you shouldn't. Tell yourself the truth. You shouldn't do that. So it's just things like that. That. Uh, so I'm not talking about great decisions. I'm talking about being honest with yourself about, how you will that will that help you be successful? No, it will not. 
It reminds me of my old friend when I was wearing the funkiest, weirdest clothes, and I don't, didn't know anything about fashion, and he took me when I was a young guy in front of a mirror, and he said, look at yourself. <laughs> and uh, I had a new respect for, for clothing and, and yeah, appearances. Yeah, I mean, so that's, I call people on, on things like that. <laughs> and nowadays, it's not, don't take the newspaper, don't take your mobile phone and talk on the phone when you're in the, yeah. Yeah, especially if you're in a billable time environment. Yes, yeah. there you go. Well, now yeah. it's time to share your worst investment ever, and since no one goes into their worst investment thinking it will be. Tell us a bit about the circumstance leading up to and then tell us your story. Sure. Yeah. Um, well, the story actually uh, plays, is consistent with what we've been talking about so far. As a venture capitalist uh, with a big firm, I uh, was the, the guy who made decisions about media and entertainment, which at the time was all about video games, was about games. And for those of you who know the gaming industry, it's, it's all about hits, it's about rock and roll. I mean, it's like you want Eric Clapton. And we had uh, a, a young man come in who had been very successful and uh, wanted to start a new company and needed $6 million to start it. And one of the things that people talk about in investing, especially in venture capital, is pattern recognition as in past performance is the best indicator of future performance. But in rock and roll, I'm not so sure. And in gaming, I'm not so sure. So I was blind a little bit by his success story. And we, we invested, we gave him $6 million to build this company. Uh, and it was all hinged on him. He, he, his, he was the core of this company. And shortly after, a couple months afterwards, at a trade show, there's a lot of tech trade shows, he uh, um, behaved inappropriately. He's smoking dope with customers in a spot where it's illegal. He went off with a, a young woman that was unclear what that relationship was, although we knew he was married. And he did it all in front of employees. So uh, in most cases, that would, uh, he, would, he should be fired. Today, he wouldn't, especially, mm -hmm. this was a few years ago. So he had a little bit of sp space. So we had a partner meeting and it came to me about what to do. And I said, and the options were fire him, in which case we'd lose $6 million. Coach him, in which case he might change or ignore it in which case, who wants to be involved in that company? So we didn't want to fire him because we didn't want to lose, or I didn't want to lose the $6 million for the fund. And I didn't want to keep him on. So we, I brought him in my office. I reamed him a new asshole and really, really yelled at him about if it happens again, you're, you will be fired. And you know what happens? He did something similar again. So he was fired and we lost $6 million. So my, the worst investment was based on my inability to tell myself the truth about, there were, there were hints of it in the due diligence before the first investment and I ignored it. I didn't double click on the, on, on the truth. And it was a, uh, you know, I learned, I learned that lesson and, you know, he was passionate, you know, it, it's really easy to get distracted by a passionate founder. And his passion is, you know, spread out into, into, into other areas, obviously. <laughs> I was distracted. There was a, uh, the due diligence was pretty good, but not great. Um, but I, I saw a shiny object with a, with a rock and roll gamer mm. and made a mistake. Yeah, and if he was a rock star, you, you may mistake. be able to get away with it, but. <laughs> yeah, and uh, you know, I, I, I don't know, he's, he's uh, still around, I don't, but he's not running a company, that's for sure. Yeah, yeah. So how would you describe the lessons that you learned from this? Well, I, I was distracted by a shiny object, him, 
uh, I was, I didn't tell myself the, in my heart of hearts, I thought it wasn't quite right. It was, it was never quite right. Mm-hmm. And the lesson was I, I should have listened to my heart, paid a lot more intent, attention to the, to the diligence and not be distracted also by his past track record. Because sometimes in investing, it, past performance is not an indicator of future performance, as all the disclaimers say. Mm. Uh, so that lots of lessons and, uh, and, and I've, I've now learned also that, and I still am making investments, still work with founders. I am, I'm only working with people that I want to, that I, I want to work with mm. that I want to hang around with, that I want to have dinner with, that I want to spend time with. And he was never in that category. Yeah. So Maybe lots I'll- of lessons. That's it's uh, an interesting story. Maybe I'll share a few um, thoughts on it. Uh, first of all, you know, this is kind of a key man risk story. If something goes wrong with that guy, you know, there's just nothing left there. And so that's an important, you know, point for the listeners to, to think about. Where do you see key man risk? Because it's not just inappropriate behavior, but, you know, that guy could lose interest or, you know, whatever. Yeah. And so this is a key man risk story in a lot of ways. Um, and then I, like, I wrote down something that you wrote, which is fire, coach, ignore. <laughs> and you know, I think there's plenty of people that may ignore it, particularly when real money is on the line. Like, how can I let yeah. this go? I can't let yeah. six million bucks go, and maybe he'll change. If I talk to him, you know, we, we can all change. <laughs> but you'll realize, the, the older we get, too, we realize how hard it is to change. You know? Yeah, yeah. Um, but your your key man point is very is very important, and it plays true today. I mean, there's a lot of well, Elon Musk. I mean, there's a lot of key man that are some of them are loose in the socket. Yeah, and also I think the other thing for the listeners out there that have businesses and are building their businesses is that every successful startup ultimately probably does come down to a key man or woman with passion and a drive, a drive to reach that. And they get some other people on board, and maybe it's two people that are really the leaders of that. But ultimately, I mean, look at um, you know, Apple as an example. So we have to take on key man or key woman risk to get where we want to go, but you also need to make sure that your business doesn't just collapse the minute that you, you know, leave that business because then there's just no redeeming value that, that, it, that an outside investor, for instance, you know, can grab onto. So I think that's a, a, a kind of a side lesson from it, too. Um, what I also was thinking about is, you know, you mentioned, you know, I was thinking about how could this be prevented? And you mentioned, like, there were some hints. And then you said due diligence. And, and I was thinking about, yeah, I mean, one of, uh, uh, one of my guests, uh, Lou Ellen, uh, and uh, she, she's uh, amazing woman that was raising money to lend money to SMEs in Cameroon, in Africa. And um, she had some investors that came in, and in the end, they, they fell apart. But the point was, was that the lesson that she learned is when you do your due diligence, you really have to talk to people who don't like that company or mm-hmm. have had a bad experience. And ultimately, that's where you can get some angle that you know you won't get and that's not easy because you know they're not going to tell you that person so you really that level of due diligence is 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 interesting and you know you could also say well it was only six million bucks you guys probably had a lot more money i mean how how deep are we going to go this guy's a rock star yeah so i think it's it's a good lesson on due diligence and thinking about how you're doing your due diligence yeah the lesson for me on due diligence was was to go deeper on the personal and people are actually pretty willing to do that Mm. it's shocking be careful out there everybody he may have, uh, he may brag about that yeah. you know if you sat down yeah. and spent an hour with him he may start bragging yeah. about it yeah so i did you know so and I'm, it's it's important not to judge people as much as wonder worry about the investment yeah so you know i'm not i don't care what he does in his personal life with you know but I did care what he did with the investment. And the last thing that I just think about, you know, you mentioned, 
you said, in front of employees. And, um, and then I was thinking, okay, so if you didn't do it in front of employees, would it be okay? And I was thinking about that, and then it reminded me of a, a guy, a, a friend of mine, a guy I know, we worked together, and he was, um, he was in sales, I was in research, and he was a fantastic salesman, but I would say a very manipulative person. In fact, something maybe a little bit of a screw loose, he was, he just, rejection didn't bother him at all. <laughs> and it, it made him an amazing salesperson, but he, he was into manipulating people. And uh, only a couple of months ago here in Thailand, uh, some women started to come forward that they had been, you know, uh, sexually, you know, accusing him of sexual misconduct in some way or another. And then all of a sudden, many women came out and had, you know, copies of messages and all that. And so uh, he's in serious trouble right now. And it just made me think that in front of employees, but for all of us, you know, that great, you know, lesson is make sure that your behavior, if it was published on the front page of the, of the newspaper, yeah. is yeah. something that you could stand by. And I think that's something that, that really uh, is a challenge. Ultimately, I think that's the challenge that I want to give to the audience from this discussion. And that is, you know, it could be you that's done bad behavior. One of the lessons I learned when I was young is, number one, when you've done something wrong, apologize. Go to the person directly and apologize. And, and they may or may not accept that apology and make amends if you owe them in some way or another. You need to, you know, make amends for that. And then, you know, you've done the best that you could in that case. You may have consequences that are severe and significant that you have to face, but face it head on. And... Uh, so I just think, you know, there's a lot of lessons from that. Anything else you would add to that? Well, just, the, you know, the one lesson that all of us should learn in high school is whatever you do, you'll get caught. You may not get, I mean, Thomas Jefferson is still getting caught for things he did, you know, so, and I think, uh, well, the other lesson is, you know, what did the Eagle say? Uh, what was once memories is, is now evidence. So video... I mean, it's, you get caught. You'll get so, caught. Think about your behavior and make sure that you, you know, make sure that it's good. So based yeah. upon what you learn from this story and what you continue to learn, what one action, now I'm, I want to think about it from an investor, a person that's investing money, time, energy in another person, what one action would you recommend our listeners take to avoid suffering the same fate? Well, the diligence, as, as we've discussed, but I think... Um, uh, don't, don't, don't go after the shiny object. I mean, my dad always said that, you know, the money uh, is not in sailboats or wineries. The money is in highway dividers and toilet bowls. And, and I think sometimes we, as an investor, you need to look at things that may not be the, may not be web three may not be NFTs. I mean, there's still opportunities, lots of opportunities in infrastructure, basic software, I mean, things that are going to make life, lives better. So shiny objects, everybody's after the shiny object. It's like watching seven-year-olds play soccer. You know, they're all on the ball. <laughs> so look, that's the perfect look visualization. Out. Yeah, look elsewhere because there's, there's opportunities everywhere right now. It, it, there's a, when I was young, my father's a salesman for DuPont, so he was, you know, selling plastics. And yeah. uh, there was a, a tiny little factory, and there was two guys that owned it and ran it, and he was like, he wanted me to meet them, and we went to some of their, like, parties and barbecues, and these guys were really cool, down-to-earth, really interesting guys. And they had a company called Go, Gojo, and, um, and they were just, you know, going gangbusters, and they were just making these plastic dispensers for liquid soap. And, oh, yeah. and, and, and then the other day, I was at the hospital with my mother here in Bangkok. I went in the bathroom, and there is a Gojo dispenser right there. And it's not a shiny yeah. object, but, boy, it's just, it, it, I think your dad was right, that it's, it's those yeah. very common things that can just make millions and yeah. millions. So. Or sometimes we joke about it in our family. For those of you who play Scrabble, you know, you get points for doing a word. And one of our sons is great at t 
taking that big long word and adding an S to it, which just happens to be on the triple points page, you know, square. And lots of times there's technologies, there's, there's products where you just need to add the S. Just add the S. Now, what is a resource that you've created or that you use that you'd like to recommend to the audience? Um, I use um, a couple things. One is I, uh, my network, you know, I, I shop things around and say, what about this? What do you know about that? So it's not about doing diligence on the person or the company, but it's about the market and asking people what's happening in that category. Um, and the other thing that people I think underestimate is uh, how current an investor needs to be. Meaning, uh, well, the best advice I ever got when I started in venture capital was uh, an, an older uh, guy I asked, you know, what's the best way to prepare? He said, the best thing you can do is read the Sunday New York Times from cover to cover. Don't just read the business section, read the front page, read the society section, read the arts and leisure section, read, read it from cover to cover, read who's getting married, because it will tell you what's current, and what's happening in the world. So I still, you know, I always did, but I, I read it now with an eye toward, you know, is this a trend? What's happening here? And I think uh, that was, was good advice that I will pass on. Fantastic. It doesn't have to be the Sunday New York Times. It could be the London Times. It could be the moral, the, the lesson is stay current, stay current. Mm -hmm. And it sounds also like stay current and stay broad, like look at the yeah. lots of different stuff that's going on from weddings to international politics to, you know, whatever. Right. Fat, look at fashion, at food, at politics. I mean, read it all. No, you have to be smart. Yeah, the best investors I know are Renaissance people. And they are, they are well read and they're actually very good writers. It's a... Uh... As a financial analyst, my job is to try to predict the future and do it in such a way that we would invest on that, you know, that we could make money from that. And if you're wrong, you know, it's trouble. And recently I wrote a, a quarterly strategy that I sent out to my clients and presented to about uh, my a small group of my clients. But what I told them is that um, I said, I think World War III just happened. And it was U.S. against Europe. And by U.S. getting Europe to sever the gas and oil ties with Russia, oh. it is a crushing blow for Europe that does not have natural resources enough to really survive. Right. Right. And then I said, and World War Four, and I'm using that euphemistically, hopefully we're not going to have another war, is going to be in Africa, where we now have serious risk of hundred, possibly a hundred million people going into starvation and famine due to the war. And China has invested a tremendous amount in Africa. And all of a sudden, America's going to wake up to, you just got a hundred million people in starvation demanding, you know, aid, and you've got your what America calls its number one adversary now, uh, deeply invested there, and you're not, except through military. What are you going to do? And that's going to be an interesting one. So keeping a broad perspective is critical. Last question. What is your number one goal for the next 12 months? Uh, um, my number one goal is to stay healthy but continue on this continue to be an evangelist for common sense in the workplace. Simple as that. Common sense in the workplace. That is my platform, and I'm an evangelist, an evangelist for that. Is that your tagline, or? It should be. I think huh. so. Common sense in the workplace. Yeah. I love it. Well, listeners, there you have it. Another story of laws to keep you winning. If you haven't yet taken the risk reduction assessment, I challenge you to go to myworstinvestmentever.com right now and start building wealth the easy way by reducing risk. 
As we conclude, Richard, I want to thank you again for joining our mission. And on behalf of A. Stotts Academy, I hereby award you alumni status for turning your worst investment ever into your best teaching moment. Do you have any parting words for the audience? Just common sense. Common sense in the workplace. Fantastic. And that's a wrap on another great story to help us create, grow, and protect our well. Fellow risk takers, let's celebrate that today we added one more person to our mission to help one million people reduce risk in their lives. This is your worst podcast host, Andrew Stott, saying I'll see you on the upside.